My name is Alex Klokas. I am the CEO of a website called Futurism.com, where we report on the breakthrough science and technology that is going to shape the future of humanity. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the World Government Summit team. I have seen firsthand how hard everybody has worked uh, to put on this incredible event, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Uh, we have a great slate of speakers for you today, starting with Kevin Kelly, who is going to be giving a talk titled AI 101. As I'm sure all of you know, Kevin is the senior maverick at Wired Magazine. He co-founded Wired in 1993 and served as its executive editor for seven years. Kevin's books include the best-selling New Rules for the New Economy, the classic book on decentralized emergent systems, Out of Control, a graphic novel about robots and angels, and then of course his well-known book, What Technology Wants. His new book, The Inevitable, is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Kevin also runs his incredibly popular blog called The Technium, with the slogan, Making the Inevitable Obvious. <laughs> Today, Kevin is going to be giving an overview of AI, um, as we all know, AI has received a lot of focus and attention over the past few years, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what exactly AI and the term artificial intelligence means. Um, and we're going to get a crash, a crash course on why the future of AI is considered inevitable. Without further ado, I'll give the stage to Kevin Kelly. Kevin, thank you. Great. So it's, it's my wonderful pleasure to be here. I'm actually not going to give a crash course on AI, but I'm going to give a crash course on some of the technologies that are going to be coming in the next 20 years and how they may have some impact on government and our lives. And there are three general technologies I want to cover. One of them is, of course, artificial intelligence, and the other two are related and enhanced by the fact that AI will be coming more common. So um, I want to have a larger message. And the larger message is that this is the best time ever to be making things, doing things, inventing things. And I want to get to that reason why. The first part of my talk on AI, uh, on technology, is about cognifying, making things smarter. So we're going to, in general, put little bits and slivers of intelligence in everything we make, including our shoes, including our clothes, including lights, doorknobs, everything. And some things we'll put a lot of intelligence into. And I call that act cognifying, making things smarter. The major problem we have in thinking about this is that we have a misconception about our own intelligence. We tend to think of our intelligence as a single dimension, like IQ which gets louder and louder. Up we go the evolutionary ladder. There's a little bit in a mouse, maybe more in a monkey, more in an idiot. Um, we're average, there's a genius, and then there's AI. This is a totally incorrect view of intelligence. Intelligence is really a whole suite, a whole bundle, a whole symphony of different notes played by different instruments. There's perception, there's spatial awareness, symbolic reasoning, deductive reasoning, all these are different types of cognition. And so far, um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are making synthetic bundles of these, um, and they vary human by human. So all of us have a slightly different mix of different types of cognition. That's why we have different personalities, that's why we have different approaches. Animal world is very similar, where they have some of the similar types of cognition, and they also, in different complex arrangements, they're all dependent on each other, but they, in some cases, may have types of cognition that exceed us in certain dimensions. It's not unusual to find a squirrel, a rodent, being able to remember the location of 10,000 different nuts that it has buried for decades, something no human can do. As we make machines, we are going to engineer them so that they too have types of cognition that exceed us in certain dimensions, but not all dimensions. Because every machine obeys the same 
principle, which is you cannot optimize every dimension. You always have to have trade-offs. That's the engineering principle. It's impossible to take something and optimize it in every single direction. So these machines will be specialized and they will have a variety, in some cases, of intelligence that exceeds ours. For instance, today, your calculator is smarter than you are in arithmetic. Okay, we're not freaked out by that because it's a very specialized thing that can't do very many other types of thinking. So we are going to make as many different types of cognition as possible artificially. However, all the rapid advances we've seen in the last five years have all come from the fact that we have learned how to synthesize one type of cognition, which is perception, pattern recognition. The deep neural nets that you hear about that have been so much in the news, AlphaGo, all these other things, are really only one type of, of a cognition, which is perception, pattern recognition, that we've been able to synthesize. We don't know how to do all the others that are involved in a human type of thinking. So we have a lot to do, but we have done really amazing work with just one type. So what we're doing is, and what I want to emphasize, is that we are making many different types of minds. Okay, so it's AIs plural, many different kinds of AIs, many different types of thinking, and almost none of them are like human. That's their advantage. It's, it's, it's the fact that they don't think like us that is their main benefit. Okay, it's the reason why we wanted to put an AI into a car to drive a car is because they do not drive like us because they drive differently, because they are maniacally focused on driving and they're not distracted. So the, so the cheap benefit is that we can make machines that don't think like humans. And the best analogy is to think of these as alien intelligences. We're going to make as many possible types of thinking as we can imagine, and many types of thinking that don't even exist in biology today. And they are all going to be alien to us. And that is their benefit, is that they're not human-like. So their advantage is that they think differently. And that is, of course, the engine of the new economy, the engine of all innovation, is thinking differently. And when we are connected to each other around the globe all the time, 24 hours a day, when we are connected to 7 billion other people, it becomes increasingly difficult to think differently. The AIs will help us to think different. And we are going to be working with them, not against them. This is a longer argument, but what we have found out is that the most powerful Chess player in the world is not an artificial intelligence chess player. It's not a human. It's the team of a human plus an AI. The best medical diagnostician in the world is not an AI. It's not a human doctor. It's a team of the two because both of them think a little differently. We call these teams centaurs based on this idea of the mythical um, creature that was half horse, half human because the team of AI plus human is much more effective than either one alone. And the US military has also adopted this very term to describe the team of a soldier plus an AI, which is better than either of them alone. And so this idea of working with AIs, because they think differently than we do, is part of um, the reason why um, I believe that um, we will have more new jobs than old jobs that go away. What we get out of all this is a second industrial revolution. The first Industrial Revolution, just to remind you, came about because of one primary invention, and that invention was artificial power. Until that moment, if you wanted to make anything in the world, you had to use muscle power, human or animal muscle power. That was the only way to make a road, only way to make a house, only way to make clothes, you had to use muscle power. With the invention of artificial power, uh, water power, steam power, coal power, electrical power and the nuclear power is the fact that we could amplify, we could harness 250 horses to drive our car. We, 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 could, we, we could use that power to throw up a skyscraper, to make an entire city, to make a factory that would make cloth by the mile, all because of artificial power. And we distributed that power on a grid, electrical grid, to anybody who wanted it. Anybody in the world could buy as much of this artificial power as they wanted and it was available to anybody. So some farmer somewhere 150 years ago could get an idea. Oh, let me take this manual muscle powered water pump and I'll buy some artificial power and I'll make an electrical pump that will run all the time. That 
recipe was the Industrial Revolution. Multiply that by a million times of taking something that was required muscle power and you're automating it into electrical power and that was the Industrial Revolution and it affected every part of our lives. We're doing the same thing again now with artificial intelligence. We're going to take artificial intelligence to that and add it to the electrical pump and we're going to make a smart pump that will maximize its efficiency, will decrease the amount of energy used, it will do all kinds of things, and we're going to multiply that by a million times. Take everything that has been electrified, everything that has been automated, and we're going to now add intelligence to it. Okay? So that smart pump is an indication and you'll multiply it by a thousand times. You take the 250 horses that are in your car motor and you add 250 minds. They're not human minds. They're different kind of thinking that are running all the time and that's a self-driving car. So the important thing is that this power, this artificial intelligence is going to be delivered on something we call a grid called the cloud. Anybody right now who wants to buy AI can buy AI. You can log on to Google or you can go log on to Microsoft or IBM and you can purchase as much AI as you want because it's going to become a commodity. It's a utility. It's present and it's cheap and it'll be available to anybody. So my suggestion is that that means that the formula for the next 10,000 startups is take something and add AI. Just as the past was take something and automate it. That was industrial revolution. This one is take something that's automated and then make it smarter. So the question and the availability of the opportunities is what would you do if you had access to a thousand minds working all the time? They're not human minds, they're alien minds, but they're available to be working all the time, 24 hours a day. What would you do with that new power? And the way that this would influence government and how I think government should approach this is first, AI should be used within government. We should, governments should use AI as much as possible. There's lots of programs. I've heard about some while I was here. I know in China, there's, they're, they're doing AI in the court system. The Supreme Court has the whole AI um, agenda. So for first is use AI. It helps to understand when you're going to regulate something if you're using it yourself. The second one is to be slow to regulate it. I think regulation can only come about effectively after there's some consensus about what it's good for, what it's not good for. And the only way we get that is by using it. So we have to use this for a while before we regulate it because we cannot understand what technology is good for unless we use it. So it's only through use that we're going to be able to have some sense before we can regulate it. The second one is I think a lot of the jobs that we fight over as AI is coming are jobs that no human should be doing. They're terrible jobs for humans. And so a lot of the jobs we should let, the old jobs we should let go and give as fast as possible to the bots. And we should embrace the new kinds of jobs that are going to be made by using AI. And the fourth one is that we should absolutely expect there to be entirely new classes of problems brought about by the fact of AI. So there are going to be difficulties, problems, harms created that are beyond our imagination by this new technology and we should be expecting that. We should not be surprised. And the last one is that I think um, this idea that this is a commodity, you, we, this is, a, treat this as a utility. This is something that's going to be available to everybody and that you don't, ever, nobody has to be an expert, you can buy this as a, a commodity and we might want to treat it as a utility. So the second force that I want to talk about is interacting. The idea that as we make devices, we more and more want to interact with them. We want to increase the interaction. And the ultimate way we interact with our devices is by going inside them, which is what you get when you put on a VR goggles. You're inside the thing. And there are two types of VR today. There's a time where we put the goggles on, and there's another kind where we have magic glasses that are clear like this, that you put on and you can see something virtual in the real world. So you see the real world and there's something virtual inside it. Of the two, it's much more difficult to do the second one. But if you can do the second one, you can do the first one by painting the glasses black. But I think most people are probably gonna counter this world through the second type through at work, where they work. And um, I just want to, before I, I get there, I wanted to, to do, indicate 
what we, the reason why this is important. So the first type, where you put the magic black glasses on and you're inside a world, the way it works, we actually uh, went up to the Burj yesterday, at the top they have a VR experience where you go up and you jump off the tower in VR. And, and the reason why that works is because um, you are experiencing something. You, when you take the goggles off, you don't remember having seen something, you remember having experienced it because, it because it works on a different part of your brain than the part that reads things or thinks about things. It's a much more primitive thing where you feel things. And that's where it tricks you. It tricks you to believing that you are present. And so that when you take it off, you remember having had an experience. And this is important because it means that it works on a different part of the brain where experiences are important, where empathy is strong, where emotions work. So what we're seeing is, is that this mixed reality where we have the magic glasses, you can see, you can make a virtual product, maybe um, you're um, uh, learning how to take apart a heart, it's really great for education because people are often using their hands and people who learn in a different way than just reading things can, can experience them and they can learn better that way. And of course in the office, uh, uh, Microsoft's vision is that you have a, a magic glasses on that you can see as many screens as you want. And you can actually, I've tried this, you can interact with them. It's very, very easy to move them virtually. So you can have an office almost anywhere you want and you can even have virtual colleagues sitting next to you. So they imagine the future of the office this way. Um, the important thing is, is that what you s experience in either types of glasses is that you experience experiences, that you have an experience. They become the new currency in this. It's not files that are being downloaded. It's not documents. The, the currency is experiences that are being shared, that you purchase, that you, um, that you, that you um, upload and download our experiences. And that's really good because we're moving from an internet of information to an internet of experiences as this stuff comes on. And among those experiences, is, is, is you can do a telepresence where you can go somewhere where you could not go by yourself as a human normally, or maybe very expensive to do, or very dangerous to go. Um, but there's a stepping ladder in economics where the higher up you go, the higher price value, and you can start with commodities where you're sowing coffee beans, all right? And so if you're really good, you add some value by turning it into a good with a brand. If you're really smart, you can add further value by turning it into a service. So instead of people having to buy the coffee, they buy the coffee service. But the ultimate added value is turning it into experience. So the ultimate experience is you go to the plantation where the coffee's being grown and you meet the plantation owner and you have a one-to-one -one relationship. That is the ultimate experience around coffee. And it, what is important to understand is that in the last 150 years, the price of almost every commodity has been going down, down, down in real dollars. And the only thing that's increasing in price these days are experiences. Okay, so uh, concert tickets instead of... Uh, a CD or a five-star um, meal at, at, with a chef. So the experiences are things that are increasing in value in real dollars. Everything else is on a commodity downward drift. So experiences now become the center of the new economy. And of all the experiences you can have in VR, cool worlds, amazing um, creatures, uh, fantastic artificial virtual objects, but the most compelling of all the things in VR are other people. By and far, people gravitate and remember the encounters they have with virtual other people. So that's why I'm, I would suggest that VR will become the most social of all the social medias. It's gonna become a very, very social engagement place and it's probably the next platform after smartphones. So, what makes great experiences is the challenge that, that you all have and making government a great experience is part of that. So again, I would say government should use VR in as much as possible. Don't try to regulate it unless you're actually using it yourself. And I think what people don't appreciate is the vast data network needed to move the vast amounts of data that are gonna be generated by VR. This is a huge opportunity um, for business, but it's also a challenge for governments because you're gonna to have to, I mean, We've seen nothing yet in terms of the amount of, of data. 5G doesn't 
doesn't cut it. We have to go much higher orders of having a data infrastructure to carry that. Um, and then the, the, the fourth thing is that this VR generates huge amounts of data about people, huge amounts of data. I'll be talking about that in a few seconds, but I think um, this is also an opportunity and a challenge for governments dealing with the amount of data that these kinds of systems are going to generate. And it's a global platform. We have to understand that. That's a challenge again for governments is that a lot of this stuff is going to be in a global perspective. So let me say the last bit of technology, which is built around this idea of sharing. And it doesn't matter what business you're in, whether you're in hotels, real estate, oil, whether you are in um, chemicals, farming, it, fashion, it doesn't matter, you're now in a data business. All right, everybody's business is data business, it's the new oil in many ways. And um, often the data about your customers and clients and citizens is as valuable as those customers themselves. And let me give you one quick example of that. So there are two um, automobile companies, one is Ford, very old, they have manufactured over their 100 years existence 100 million vehicles, and they're worth somewhere around $44 billion. Tesla is struggling, a new company is struggling to produce 200,000 vehicles, a much, much smaller subset, okay? And yet they're valued more than Ford, and why is that? And I, and I think the answer is simply that Ford, despite the fact that having produced 100 million vehicles, has zero miles knowledge data about how their users actually drive their cars. They have no idea. Whereas Tesla, with a much smaller set of sales, already has a 1.3 billion miles of user customers' behavior in their cars. So they know their customers. In fact, you could say in some senses that Tesla is not a car company, but a data company with computers on wheels. Right? So, so, so they're being valued because they have so much data about how people are actually using things. So we're just at the beginning of this kind of a world where we are able to track people's data more and more. And by the way, the VR companies, in order to track your presence in that, you're, you're being tracked at a degree that's not even possible in real life. And that's a huge amount of data that the VR companies will be having. But more important, that data is increasing in value by sharing. Data that's not shared is not very valuable. So, and it's just not sharing the data, it's this idea that we're collaborating and cooperating at a scale that was never possible before, at almost a planetary scale. What we're inventing is new tools that would allow us to take these social connections, these two billion people that Facebook has already connected, Right now, we're sharing in a very mild way, sharing gossip, sharing cat pictures, but we could be collaborating with new tools at a much higher order. So imagine if there's a, we have a global platform made with all these technology, and I would predict in the next 20 years that we will see the emergence of a million people who are gonna to work together, collaborate together in real time to produce something. A million people collaborating in real time to produce something. That's where we're headed in the very near future. And so the, one of the questions about the government is, is like, you know, what kind of data do you have? Do you have the data about um, people? And I think data infrastructure is going to be a fundamental thing. I would suggest that we also go away from the idea that data can be owned. Um, this idea that, that anybody can really own data is, is, I think, a little bit misguided. Privacy must be symmetrical, and I can describe it very simply by saying, if they know about me and I don't know who they are and I don't know what they know and I can't correct it and I get no benefit, that doesn't feel very good. But if I know that I can watch you and that I know who you are and I know about you and I know that your data and I can correct it and I get some benefit, that is symmetrical and that feels more comfortable. Security is a public issue. Um, security is really the weakest link in your, whatever system you have. Is, a, is the strength of that system. So therefore, your security on your computer and your phone becomes my problem. So I have an interest in demanding that you, your security is better. So we have this kind of like a commons, like a, like a public health issue, where we're actually gonna to come to the point where we demand that your security be at a certain level before you're allowed to be connected. Because your security affects my security. 
And lastly, data is a global platform. It's, it's not just about one state, one part of the world. We are making a global robot the size of the planet, and we're inside of it, and we have to understand that this is a global platform. So we're at the beginning of, the very, very beginning of these changes. I think the last changes from the internet will be very mild kind of ch changes that we're going to be seeing. We've just started that. And um, I would also emphasize that while I am very bullish on, on AI and VR, I think that the greatest products in 25 years have not, even, have not even been invented today. We're not talking about them because they have not been invented. But they're going to be the ones that are going to be the most powerful in 25 years. But if we take 25 years from now, say 2053, and look back to today, there are several things that we would say. We would say, oh, it all kind of started around 2018. That was when all this stuff was really happening. This is the very beginning of it. And right now, if we, as we look in, you know, right now, if we look into the past, we would realize that there have never been better tools to make things. And right now, there's never been larger markets to sell them. There's never been cheaper money to borrow to make them. And there's never been lower barriers to starting something. This is the best time in the history of the world to be making something. And if we look into the future, we have the same thing, which is that, oh, compared to where we'll be in 30 years from now, there are no experts right now. There are no AI experts compared to what we know in 30 years. There are no VR experts compared to what will be in 30 years. So there are no experts now. There's all these low-hanging fruits of things to do, just like there was 25 years ago in the internet, where you just took something and put it online. Now you can take something and add AI. There's relatively no competition compared to what there'll be in 30 years. And there's cheap entry. So from the perspective of the future, this is also the best time to be making something. So from the view of the past, this is the best time. From the view of the future, this is the best time. This is a tremendous opportunity right now to be involved in these things. It's the best time ever to do something. And most importantly, um, you're not late. Okay, you're not late. So thank you for your attention.